Welcome to Book to Where Two Guys Tell You About the Books They're Reading. I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snedden. This week we are reviewing Growing Things by Paul Tremblay. Do you think it's growing things? Like things that are growing? Or is it growing things? <laughs> like he's growing some things? Does that oh, make sense? Like these are the things that he is growing? Well, like, yeah, like you could grow tomatoes, but the tomatoes can also just grow. Um, I took it as, uh, as the, like in reference to the things that are growing. Okay. Well, that makes sense considering the first story. I was just right. wondering if maybe it's, it, maybe it's a little bit of a play on words. Hey, he is a very well ambiguous as... writer, so maybe he meant it to be both. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Ambiguous Horror. <laughs> We're going to talk about that, um, probably for the next, you know, 40 minutes or so. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for anybody that's not familiar with the work of Paul Tremblay, um, I'm going to give you a bio, but shame on you. Paul is the author of Disappearance at Devil's Rock and the World Fantasy Award nominated and Bram Stoker Award winning A Head Full of Ghosts, which has been optioned by Focus Features. He is also the author of the novels The Little Sleep, No Sleep Till Wonderland, Swallowing a Donkey's Eye, and Floating Boy and the Girl Who Couldn't Fly, which incidentally is co-written by Stephen Graham Jones. He's the author of the short story collection In the Meantime. His essays and short fiction have appeared in the Los Angeles Times and numerous Year's Best, air quotes, anthologies. He is the co-editor of four anthologies, including Creatures, 30 Years of Monster Stories with John Langan. Paul is on the board of directors for the Shirley Jackson Awards. He lives outside of Boston, Massachusetts, has a master's degree in mathematics, and has no uvula. Why do uvula. I feel... Damn it. I, I knew it. And I know because you know what? Because I've read this bio, some form of this bio, like three other times. And I'm pretty sure I never even look at that word until I get to it. He has no uvula. 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 It's a stupid word. <laughs> um, this bio was obviously created before The Cabin at the End of the World came out mm -hmm. um, because it is not mentioned. Um, and another glaring absence. <laughs> I didn't and want to be the one yeah. to bring it up. Yeah, because, well, it's my turn to moan. Uh, mm -hmm. He was one of the stories in the book anthology that came out in 2013. Yeah, I noticed that that's not in here. Yeah. Maybe, mm -hmm. though, as we go through these stories, maybe we'll find that his story that appeared in the book anthology was in this book. Well, time will tell on that one, my friend. Yeah, I don't um, want to spoil anything. <laughs> I'm going to give a quick synopsis, and then we'll talk a little bit about our history with Paul. Um, the, uh, the book growing things and other stories is a masterful anthology featuring 19 pieces of short fiction. Um, it is an exciting glimpse into Paul Tremblay's fantastically fertile imagination from global catastrophe to the demons inside our heads. Tremblay illuminates our primal fears and darkest dreams in startlingly original fiction that leaves us unmoored. As he lowers the sky and yanks the ground from beneath our feet, we are compelled to contemplate the darkness inside our own hearts and minds. This is a really action-packed, that's like a movie trailer <laughs> synopsis. We I got should, excited. We should mention that we did edit that down because there were synopses for a few of the stories yeah. in that synopsis. So it was like an Inception type thing happening. Uh, and we chose, since we're going to be talking about some of these stories, to kind of just edit that portion out. Yeah, they were trying to do our job. Yeah. But this is not our first Trembly, as I mentioned. And Rob has statistics, I'm sure, with page counts and graphs and charts that he's going to share with us. Oh, man. I dug up my spreadsheet, and I just want to talk about a little history with Paul. So... <laughs> <laughs> Jumping in the way back machine, the first uh, book that we reviewed by Paul way back in 2012 was Swallowing a Donkey's Eye. Um, with, do you remember who guest reviewed that with us? No. Sean P. Ferguson. Oh my God, SPF. They, yes, Sean, yeah. Sean and Paul have this like, they had at the, you know, I'm assuming they still do, but at the time they were like pretty close friends and, you know, very chummy online and stuff. So. Sean joined us for that. That was, um, if you want to talk about a guy who's, who's, I don't want to say his style has changed, but his stories he wants to tell. It's hard to reconcile that the author of Swallowing a Donkey's Eye 
is the author of A Head Full of <laughs> Ghosts, or I mean, any of these stories, any of his last, you know, whatever, three novels, this short story collection. Yeah. And I know that um, his earlier works, The Little Sleep and No Sleep Till Wonderland, were basically crime novels. Crime fiction, so yeah. he has, yeah, he has definitely um, morphed a little bit. He talks a little bit about that in kind of like the afterword of this book. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it is interesting to see um, the changes from when we first read his stuff. Yeah, and so after after that, um, I think we had him on for an interview, but um, the next thing that happened between us was we published his story, uh, Scenes from the City of Garbage and the City of Clay, in our anthology. And that is is kind of a weird fiction, but it's more just weird fiction. It's not horror, and it's not crime or anything. It's more kind of floats in like the literature world, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the next review we did was Head Full of Ghosts in 2015. Jump to 2016, we review Disappearance of Devil's Rock, both of which we gave five stars, by the way. Jumping over 2017 and 2018, just last year, we did Cabin at the End of the World, another five-star review. Uh, oh, by the way, the beginning of the year, we also started with that Evanson Trembley mm -hmm. um, novella thing, which we yep. also gave five stars. Um, so he's just, even the first book, Swallowing a Donkey's Eye, you gave four stars, I gave four and a half. Um, so he's always been well regarded by us. Yeah, I mean, and, and rightfully so. It, it, <laughs> I don't know if anybody else is paying attention. Um, Rob, you are the the booked um, record keeper. How many short story collections have you reviewed this year? Uh, zero. So the last one we did, if you want to count it, was the original Adventures of Ford Fairlane. But that felt more like a full story as opposed to short stories, right? I mean, it was like two novellas, right? Yeah. yeah. So look, that's that's the point I'm trying to make. And, <laughs> and I will tell you, I, I think I speak for both of us. We could say we're generally not big fans. But I know that when Rob comes up and says short story collection, my first my first instinct is how do I get us out of doing this? Yeah. I, I, I've grown to like short stories more than I did when we started this podcast. But there's a couple of things. They're still not my favorite. And they're really hard to talk about for you guys. So we get a 10-page story that we want to talk about, but we really can't spoil anything for you. So you get like the lamest, weakest synopsis for it, and then we have to move on. Yeah. So it, it it's tough personally for me to sit down and read short stories. Not that I don't find some of them terrific, and we're going to talk about a few really great ones tonight. But it's so hard for us to talk about them with you guys. This episode, though for Patreon contributors will bring the first ever and again I'm going to check with the, the records guy Rob I don't think we've ever done a spoiler talk for short stories before we have not um, I'm not sure that any other short story collection has needed it as much as this one though That's I agree um, if you want to go back and look at our actual legit short story collection the last one we, re we reviewed was um, the Entropy and Bloom Jeremy Robert Johnson, and that was back mm -hmm. in like the su the summer of 2017, I think. So, yeah. probably about two years ago, exactly. Yeah. So uh, there is one more on the horizon for this year. We're not going to talk about that now, but <clears throat> I again, Rob <laughs> brought something to my attention, and I said, "All right, you know, there are some times where I just have to say, yeah, this is probably something we should do," and uh, that's where growing things comes in. Yeah. So for anybody who hasn't. Uh, who's only started tuning in in the last like two years or so and hasn't listened to one of our um, uh, collection or anthology reviews. The way we break it down is um, we've got notes about every story so that we can know kind of like as a jo to jog our memory about what they were. And we have each chosen our top three stories from the collection. And usually what we do is we do the quickest little synopsis review of the individual stories um, just so that we can talk about what we liked so much about them. So we each have three. We're going to talk about six. Maybe, you know, we'll bleed over and, and mention some of the extraordinary things about some of the other stories. Um, but that's it. We're going to talk about six of the 19 stories. Then we'll just give it a rating like everything else. And we're going to whip some really cool, I think, um, spoiler talk on you for the Patreon uh, su uh, supporters. So I'm going to do mine in a, like, like third place, second place, first place for mine. Um, and again, I, it's tough. Cause I think when I say that, 
what I don't necessarily mean is that these are the three best stories in the book. I think they're the ones that are the three most worth discussing. They're also very good stories. Um, Rob and I have a little bit of crossover um, on one story. That's why I said, would I put that story ahead of these, like in a head-to-head battle? Yeah, probably against one or two. It'll probably make more sense as we go on. But the first story I want to talk about is called Her Red Right Hand. Uh, this is a uh, a story about a, a girl, a young girl, who loses her mother to disease, um, but then has to face like a supernatural entity that is mocking her and then simultaneously blaming her for her mother's death. And this is where it gets hard to do this, what we do here. (laughs) Because there are a lot of elements of this story, although it's a a very short story. It's maybe 10 pages, give or take. Um, There's some stuff I'd like to talk about, but we just can't do it here. So suffice it to say that uh, there's definitely some supernatural For some people, there will be something very familiar about this story as it unfolds. Um, But there is a sorrow in it that's just awful. And and I'll go on to say, like, this girl is a pretty talented artist. And there's a lot of time spent talking about pictures she drew of her mom as her mom is slowly fading away um, due to the disease that she has. So uh, a common theme through this is some really sad shit, we'll say. But this one was was really up there in the sad department. Yeah. Um, so a friend of the podcast, Jesse Lawrence, has also read this collection. And um, so I was texting him uh, last night as I kind of wrapped up finishing reading the final stories. And this was one of the ones that I had to talk to him about because of how it made me felt and I'm going to be as vague as I can about that here, but this is definitely one that I'm going to talk about in spoiler talk. Um, if you want to talk about emotional impact, I think this is the one that affected me the most. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, what's your, what's your first one you're going to talk about? I'm going to do the same thing. Um, going third to second to first. Um, and and the and so the the first story I want to talk about is called "It's Against the Law to Feed the Ducks," um, and and so this is a story about uh, a family. It's a it's a mother and a father and a and a son and a daughter. The son's probably what five or six, I'm guessing, and the daughter is an infant, basically. Mm-hmm. And they are traveling to they're kind of familiar. Um, vacation spot which is like a cabin by a lake uh in lake winnipesaukee i think it actually uh mentions it specifically by name and um so you get all of the normal family vacation stuff they get to the you know the cabin you're learning all the quirks about how the family interacts and stuff and um and it, it establishes little familial things that um as the story goes on and the way that in the turns the story takes those familial things kind of are emotional um, hooks, you know, as they go on. And so, and then something happens. And in the tradition of Paul Tremblay, we don't necessarily know what happens, but the thing that happens mm-hmm. causes the whole story to shift into a much darker direction. Um, and we get to see how, how the world and the family and everything reacts to the thing. That wasn't too spoilery, right? <laughs> no. As a matter of fact, you, you really tiptoed your way around a lot of stuff. Because if I had to sum this up, I would go a different direction. On You know what yeah. I mean? On my like some sort. Um, yeah, we see this entire story um, virtually through the eyes of, of a four-year-old boy. Yeah. Which um, is, is very touching. I seem to remember when we were reviewing A Head Full of Ghosts that I had actually said that... Um, the younger sister was maybe a little too smart for her age. Mm -hmm. And I feel this child might be too, but it makes for just really solid storytelling. Like I can, I can kind of forget, you know what I mean? Like in in my rational mind says, yeah, this kid's way too sharp for a four year old. Um, That being said, it makes for just a a really gripping. um, and, And again, also a very sad tale. Not that the story itself is sad, just that you're seeing it unfold through the eyes of someone that young. And I think he does a great yeah. job of kind of capturing 
innocence interpreting things that are happening around it. Yeah, and and I agree. That is probably the biggest strength of the story. And one of the things that I like is that at one point, he acknowledges it from the perspective of the kid by saying, like, you know, it's one of those things that they think I don't understand or something like Mm -hmm. that. Yep. So... Uh, you get this like innocent perspective of of the thing that's happening, um, but with a little bit, the, the door is cracked open a little wider than maybe the parents think it is. So, uh, yeah, it's just really good. All right, my second story is the Society for Monsterhood. This one is probably the silliest story in in the book so it's like there's a lot of supernatural stuff happening that's really um, out there through the course of this collection this one is probably the most tongue-in-cheek of them so to set it up there are these four kids who they go to an affluent school through some luck slash lottery system so they're picked on a lot and I'm going to step into this one a little farther than, than maybe I want to. But essentially, they one day claim that no one will pick on them anymore because they have met a monster who is going to protect them. Um, and a series of, you know, in a very short period of time, a series of very, we'll call it unrealistic, you know, to us as readers, um, events occur. But it's really this endearing story. Uh, and, and I don't want to say there's a, like a twist, but the ending of it, winds up making the rest of the story so much more impactful. And again, super vague. And I realize it probably doesn't make sense to anybody who hasn't read it. I think anybody who has read it will understand exactly what I'm saying. Um, but it's a story that's, that winds up having a, a, you know, punchline for, for lack of a better term, that's far more serious than the story that makes the story more serious than it deserves to be. And, and I really liked it for that little bit of like a lighter touch but still having a really poignant um, ending. Yeah, it had one of those, like... <laughs> I'm going to show my age here. Do you remember those memes where it was, like, Keanu Reeves? Like, with that kind of whoa look on his face, and it mm-hmm. was, like, someone thinking about something from a perspective they never saw, and it totally changed everything? Yep. Yeah, it had yeah. one of those kind of things at the end. Um, that, And that's the power of the story, is that it's it's written... It kind of normalizes the supernatural part of it like if if you told me livius that you found a monster and you were totally serious um like that would be like a world changing event right right but this this didn't really disrupt things too much um no no it didn't so and then and then with the way that the end uh plays out that's so it's it's not the supernatural supernaturality of it that that is the thing that upends everything and i thought that was that was a good strength of the story Mm -hmm. i really really like that one there's some really clever it's just a very clever story yes all right uh i'm going to talk about my middle of the road story is the titular story growing things so uh, this one from the very beginning you're introduced to the the peril of the story which is that um around the world like basically these plants are go- growing out of control and uh it's basically an apocalyptic t- apocalyptic type story set on the basis of the idea that plants are overgrowing everything and it's destroying everything um this story takes place in an individual house with sisters Mary and Marjorie who those names might be familiar to anybody who's read Head Full of Ghosts um and them dealing with uh, the fact that, like, their father uh, is kind of losing it, and um, I, I, I'm probably gonna stop myself, but like mm-hmm. how they handle the fact that like this unstoppable cataclysmic event is happening, and it's just a matter of time before it reaches them. Yeah, and that story. And I just, I didn't have enough time, but I'm pretty sure that the story growing things is mentioned in A Head Full of Ghosts. Not not by name necessarily. The concept, yeah. Yeah, is is there um, in that, in that. So it, it, it's an interesting, 
you know, kind of crossover story, although we know that that didn't happen. Like if you're a, a, a fan of the book, you know right. that it's a it's a weird head full of ghost fan fiction. More than, you know, instead of a, a story oh, that actually happened to those characters. Um, I thought it was a great way to kick off the collection, though. Yeah. Um, I'll talk more about in my fe- my feelings in spoiler talk, but mm. I, I had I had a, one of the strongest reactions to a story for this story. Now hmm. I actually kind of like I, I threw together a chronology of when these stories were published because at the back of the book it says where they were previously published and everything, and I put it up against when the books he wrote and were published. And the weird thing about this one is, Growing Things was published in a collection in 2010, and and um. Head Full of Ghosts came out in 2015. So it's my impression that this story at least came first, and then he kind of took those, you know, he made a bigger right. book out of that and incorporated that story into it. So, yeah, pretty cool. Oh, now A Head Full of Ghosts is fan fiction about growing, growing things. Growing things, yeah. <laughs> oh, crap. Either way, I re- yeah. I have to rethink the whole thing now. <laughs> um, yeah, really powerful story. My third and final story is one that I wish I, I, we could talk about more than I could talk at least about my other ones. But I think yeah. deserves like actual legit analysis. And that's notes from the dog walkers. There is something. Um, so the story is this. I'm going to get I know I'm saying like Sai, like the story. The story is a, a person who very clearly from page one is is Paul, hires dog walkers for his dog. The dog walkers come, um, you know, three times a week at, you know, in the afternoon. And, and as part of the service, they, they leave a note. Um, you know, just a little quick little thing about, you know, oh, your dog was really happy today. We saw a black cat on our tree, you know, whatever. And then if, if they peed or pooped, little check marks, right? Well, this devolves from that into these multiple dog walkers sharing their feelings and their thoughts uh, on things up to and including Paul Tremblay, the author and his body of work. So like I said, is that a little more than I should say about the story? Maybe. But what I will say is when I got probably two thirds of the way into that story, and it's one of the longer ones in the collection, Mm-hmm. I really started thinking there this is fucking just is genius. It's like literal <laughs> genius. Um I actually thought I was going to have to like fight Rob for for this being the I actually thought this was going to be the 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 collection winner, right? Like we'd agree on this being the the best story in there. Um it's uh, it's a very introspective look at Paul through the eyes of dog walkers. Um, it's commentary on his storytelling style. It's commentary on his writing. Um, I'm sure that some of it is actual commentary on his actual fears and hopes and, and whatever. But what a great way um, to get a little bit more of a look at the author in a way that to me remains far more interesting than there just being a long epilogue. A paragraph after paragraph about you know some of the things he knows that his strengths are or some of his weaknesses maybe as a writer or, or whatever and the fact that in that story he actually says that the publishers that his publishers refer refer to him as mr um well i said it earlier mr horror ambiguity mr ambiguous horror and mr ambiguous horror sorry yeah. which no words have ever <laughs> spoken more truth to that. Like I, I, I know it because <laughs> some of the stories are they're they're a little vague. They leave a lot to the imagination. But as I was reading through this, I was like, well, what do you expect? You've read three of his horror novels. I would say two of them were really ambiguous, if not all three. You know, but but the fact that a he knows that and that b his his publishers know that I mean that's just it's a, just a genius thing to include in, in the story. Yeah, uh, I, I I will I'll, I'll, I'm going to share Livius's level of being impressed by like the idea for this story because like from the get go 
Like, there's nothing that's not awesome about this story. Like, I can tell you now that this is the most, this is the most um, instances of the words pee and poop that I've read in one story. Because every time a dog walker left a note, and there's tons of them, it says pee and poop, and then there's a check mark next to the thing. So that that's great. He's making us read pee and poop over and over and over again, um, <laughs> which it you know. It, obviously it's 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 a thematic thing but it almost breaks up the tension um of of this increasingly unsettling thing and the unsettling part of it is and he he actually anal- does an analysis of this in another story that that um didn't make my top 3 um is access access to celebrity um because like you, you don't think about it at first but like these people go into your home to pick up your dog to take it for a walk, um, and so there's there's a there's a vulnerability in the story that I thought was very good too. Oh, for sure, I I absolutely loved it. Yeah. Um, all right, wrap it up, buddy. What do you got? All right, my number one by default because um, me and Livius both wanted notes from the dog walkers uh, is a story called "It Won't Go Away." I'm not going to say very much about this story at all. Um, but again, this is one of those stories that feels a little self-referential um, because the the protagonist of the story is a writer and um, lives in the Northeast, like where, you know, Paul lives and talks about other writers and going to conferences and stuff. And um, the story is about the fact that um, a friend, a writer friend of his committed suicide And, um, it was not long after he had seen this friend. And so there's all of the impact of, of the fact that his friend committed suicide, but there's something very creepy that happens when he receives something in the mail from his friend. I think it's two months after the suicide. Yes. Yes. And, um, a, a, a terrific, um, just like a, like a good horror story. Yeah. Um, skin crawling it, yeah and it's it's i don't want to say one of the ones like because they're you know there's so few but it's probably the most straightforward like it's not ambiguous at all no yeah and, there's no yeah there's no um misinterpreting what's going on yep and uh definitely definitely a good one i don't know man i i think that in spoiler talk i'm we're gonna we're gonna come up with with a with an anthology winner i think i, I oh think no I can win it's over. okay it's it's notes from the dog walker. It's, okay, all it right, is. all right. That's the anthology winner. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, there was it was uh, you know I gave it up to you because I knew that there was a, like there was at least five or six that I really really mm-hmm. enjoyed. So I knew that we could you know we could share. We're gonna head over to patreon.com slash booked, and we are gonna talk about some of these stories. And we're probably I, I get the feel it's gonna be a little bit longer of a spoiler talk because I think we're gonna talk about other stories too. <laughs> like we kept yeah. left, kept the limit to six here. Um, we're gonna go do that. We'll be right back. If you're not a patron Patreon patron, I really have to figure out how to say that. <laughs> if you are not a supporter, a financial supporter of the book podcast, um, you can become one for just one dollar a month and have access to our spoiler talk for growing things and spoiler talk for many, many, many books and many, many more to come. And Paul, if you want to listen to our spoiler talk, just let us know. We're not going to make you pay a buck a month. <laughs> that's, that's very <laughs> kind of you. We're going to give you a half off discount. All right, we're back from spoiler talk. We're ready to wrap this up. We had a lot of good conversation. We spoiled like half the book. So if that's what you're into, you can go listen to us spoil the book. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think there's people. I you know I, I do know people. Where, you know, I'll say like, oh, I, I went and saw this movie and they're like, oh, hey, is this what happens? And I'm like, what kind of fucking monster are you? And then they get mad because I refuse. Like, even when you tell me, spoil it for me, I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to spoil it for you. I'm that guy. I don't mind if things get spoiled yeah. for me. Ugh, Un- unless I'm like so super looking forward to them, you know? Yeah. Could um, be. Yeah. Anyway, do you want to you wanna start? Um, yes. I think we should start by crowning a clear winner for this collection oh it's clear yeah so um just in case you didn't catch it before we went over to spoiler talk we are in full agreement although there was absolutely no talk about it in spoiler talk that notes from the dog walkers is the best um story in this um collection 
it reminds me a little bit, and you won't really get what I'm talking about here. Um, towards the end of the Dark Tower series, Stephen King, spoiler alert, um, in case you haven't read the Dark Tower series and you're planning on doing so, kind of becomes a character in his own book as the mm. creator of the stories. It's like a weird thing. And that's not what happened here. But there was enough insight into Trembley as a creator, but learning that as a character in one of the stories that he wrote that for me is is pure genius. And, and easily, I was halfway into this and I was like, nope, this is the one. I can tell you, I don't care what he writes after this. This is going to be my my uh, my number one for the for the collection. Now, I want to I want to name an honorary mention of of uh, the collection, and that's the notes at the end. I think um, you don't always get that kind of thing in a collection of short stories. And the fact that Tremblay took the time to make specific notes and explanations or add context to not every story, but a, a good amount of them uh, really helped uh, kind of deepen my appreciation for the individual stories and like have a, you know, a good feeling about the collection as a whole. So that would be my honorary um, not story winner. <laughs> the best note section in this book 100%. without fail so all right i will go with my wrap up um it's super super easy for me to want to read paul's work um it has been um I, if i'm being honest since a head full of ghosts like swallowing a donkey's eye i liked a head full of ghosts like solidified that for me i know over the past few weeks we've talked a few times about like greenlit authors like if this guy comes out with a book we're just going to read it paul is for sure in that category um it took me a little while to get going on this story collection some of that might have been like where i'm at in life you know or whatever or maybe the, the, the first few stories didn't really speak to me um i tended to like the stories later in the collection but um I, it doesn't take away from the fact that paul is a brilliant writer um he's really ambiguous which doesn't always play well with me um there's a little bit of talk about that in spoiler talk um but that doesn't take away from the fact that he creates um vivid uh, let's just call it as like apocalyptic worlds right and most of these stories are a good percentage of them and and they're always fun to read even if sometimes um one of my notes because i did the same thing rob did we're kind of working from his notes one of them just said um don't know about this story like that was literally my my like i just kind of shrugged and said i'm not i'm not really sure what happened um but the stuff that's good isn't just good it's phenomenal so um you know we mentioned a few here there's some other ones i really like as i as i scroll through the list and i think that um if you're a little bit like me and not a huge fan of short stories you could certainly do a lot worse um, than than picking up a, a Paul Tremblay short story. Well, this one specifically, I can't speak for the other one, um, as a gateway into super weird, but really, really well-written short stories. It's five stars for me. Um, Livia said it. Like We're, we're always going to be enthusiastic about reading new Paul stuff. Um, and yeah, we're, we're pretty gun-shy about short story collections lately. So um, it was... It was the fact that it was Paul that brought us back to a short story collection. That being said, man, um, I did not have... I feel like I, I, I took it a little differently. Like, the first three or four stories for me were just easy to just punch right through. And um, so it started me off at a good pace for the book. I read this in three sittings. And um, it, it just... I liked... I liked all the stories. Obviously, I, I liked some more than others, and I was affected deeper with some than, than others. But uh, Paul has just kind of a way about him. And the interesting thing about this collection, and he, he kind of notes it in his notes at the back, is that these stories span. Um, the oldest story is was published in 2004. It's against the law to feed the ducks. And the latest one was published in this collection. So you've got a 15-year span so these aren't aren't just you know these are the like the stories I wrote for a collection. This is like kind of a curated list of of hits that have come along in the last almost two decades, and so uh, it's interesting to see how his style has been consistent over the years. Because some of the ones that happened early on, I would have thought he wrote, you know, lately. Uh, so his older stories aren't necessarily different. Um, but it's kind of cool to see that that spectrum. That being said, 
man, uh, growing things, the first story punched me in the gut for reasons that I discuss over in spoiler talk. And, um, there are some stories in here that just, it won't go away. Just made me shiver. Um, notes from the dog walkers just blew my mind because it was just such a brilliant approach to telling a story. Um, her red right hand, although it had no right to, based on <laughs> what the story's about, just fucking destroyed me. Um, and and so all of these stories, even the lighter hearted ones, like we didn't mention it, but Swim wants to know if it's as bad as Swim thinks, kind of gave me a cool thing. Like, I don't know if this is a real thing, but um, the word Swim means someone who isn't me. And I'd never heard that before. And like that charmed the hell out of me. So even the fact that that word, that story had a, a new meaning for a word that I never thought of before. I feel like I got something out of all of these stories and um, I just came away feeling very positive about it. And like I said before, his notes at the end really helped to deepen the meaning of the stories for me. So just an awesome overall collection and yeah, five stars. I wonder the same thing. And, um, Swim is a is an acronym on Urban Dictionary for someone who isn't me. So that is a common usage. Okay, I guess never I don't know. How, I'm not sure how common. I'd never heard it either. But I, I, you know, again, I thought the same thing. I was like, huh, that's pretty clever. Um, it is. Uh, I, I think it's a lot used in the. Well, it says to avoid self incrimination in context such as boards discussing drug use. Yeah. So that's the gotcha. yeah. That's from JohnsAddiction.com, by the way. Um, yeah. Great, great stuff. Um, one of two. One of only two short story collections. I mean, the other one's an anthology. I guess there's a difference, but it's one of only two that we're doing this year. <laughs> we'll see about that. We're booked. We'll see. I mean, we're booked, but we're <laughs> also schedule full for almost the rest of the year. So. All right. All right. Um, I, uh, next up, man. What is next up? I don't even know what's next up. We've got something coming up next. Yeah, so it is uh, The Fearing by uh, John F.D. Taff. And this is an interesting one because it is the first part of a multi-part serialized novel. Is that, if I'm getting that correct? Yeah, I believe so. Um, we're going to do the first one. We'll see <laughs> if... So, again, I wanna, what I want to avoid is the Miriam Black, where we review, like, six books in a... Although great to read and i really love that series um we're, we're gonna see how this goes i might also like to have john taff on because he's a great guy and we had a lot of fun when we had him on in that hot mess of a podcast where we had three guests yeah for, we also um, had him on with um remember josh mallerman helped us interview him yep that's correct yeah. so um uh so you know we're kind of working out we have we have a few openings in our schedule which are openings for a reason they're breaks um, but there's a few people we're hoping to bring you. John may be one of them. I guess we'll see after we review this and see how, how he feels about our review. <laughs> he may not want to talk to us. Um, I'm pretty sure at this point there are a few people that, that wouldn't want to be uh, guests on the podcast anymore. But yeah, that's next. And then we're going to follow that up with a week of not reviewing a book so that we can review what apparently is the hottest book in the world right now. The Wanderers by Chuck Wendig. Yeah, that one's blowing up. Like, so we have a ton of like big stuff on the horizon. Um, everybody's talking about this book um, from people that we know online to like news outlets and stuff. Um, it's kind of a big deal. So I'm looking forward to cracking into that. It is 770 pages long, so it's a little bit daunting. I'm glad we're taking a break. Um, but yeah, looking forward to that. And then I think. Not too long after that is going to be Rob Hart's The Warehouse. So those are the two that are just ringing all the bells right now for everybody. Um, and we've got them both on the horizon. Here's the thing. Like Olivia said, we are we're, 2019 is basically locked in. Um, and so that might work against us in some ways. Like the TAF series of books uh, have a very aggressive release schedule. So I think two or three of them are coming out this year. Um, so that being said... I don't know how flexible we're going to be with time, but I'm excited about practically everything that's on our list for the rest of the year. It is a very good looking list. It is also very loaded with books that we're probably going to like, which always kind of makes me a little, you know, uncomfortable. 
Does that make sense? Like we need to get some garbage in there? Well, just like we need to take a chance <laughs> on something. So any gaps we do have, I am going to lobby hard for stuff we're not familiar with. Yeah. Um, you, you know, because like I said, I think it's important that we read. Like I don't want to purposely read bad. So who the fuck wants to do that, man? The average book that we review takes me five, six hours to read. Like that's a long fucking time Look, it, it, to commit to something you know is going to be bad. For example, if Rob said, hey, buddy, come on over. We're going to watch um, um, Brothers-in-Law. Is that the name of that movie? Brother-in-Laws? Do you know what I'm talking about? It's one of those fucking buddy comedy oh, movies. Step Brothers? Step Brothers. That's the one. You know, and they'd be like, ah, it's only 90 minutes. I'd, I'd fight him. Like, I'd say, we, we have to fight because I'm not <laughs> spending 90 minutes in this garbage. So when I am willing to read a spend five hours on a Patterson book or, or whatever, it's really because I want to explore it. Um, cause I don't want, I, I won't even spend 90 minutes watching a Sorry. garbage movie, but I'll spend six hours fucking reading, you know, t- take your pick. There's been a bunch of them, um, over the course of this podcast. So, so I almost feel it's like for science to, is what you're saying. I mean, essentially right. it's important right. to know why <clears throat> we don't think it's a good book. I mean, it doesn't matter ultimately cause we go and, and have we ever read a book that we didn't like that was universally panned? No, there's a lot of five star reviews for books that we thought were absolute garbage. That we knew were absolute garbage? Well, that we thought were absolute garbage. That we knew? <laughs> well, yeah, Fifty Shades of Grey. I mean, we suspected. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I don't think we went into the zoo thinking it was going to be great. It's true. And we were right. That was not great. Yeah. The Thomas Harris one was a fucking surprise. <laughs> that really did sneak up on us. That was an That English. was a surprise. Yeah. I'll give you an update. We did not hear from our fellow book reviewer friend on YouTube. Big hard um, books and classics yeah. or whatever. Yeah, I don't think he listened to the episode. But anyway, um, yeah, that's that's kind of my take on it. Can I say one more thing before we go? Please. I went to the movies. Really? That's really all I should have to say. That should be enough. Uh, I went and saw Yesterday. Really? Are you familiar? Yeah, well, I mean, I kind of know. It's It has to do... Isn't it like, what if the Beatles didn't exist or something like that? Yeah, so the setup is a little wonkier than that. Um, a, a aspiring but struggling musician who's just about giving up on music um, gets into a car accident. He awakes from a coma with injuries and stuff and uh, slowly, this, through a process, discovers that he's the only one that's ever heard of the Beatles. Um, he then... He then um, D- decides to, you know, like, like, you know, he decides to start performing Beatles songs and essentially rockets the stardom. I don't think I've said anything that's not in the trailer. Um, it was, it was an endearing movie. It, I had some issues with the ending, but, but all in all, it's one of those kind of like good family feel good kind of movies. And if you're even a little bit of a Beatles fan, um, obviously there's a lot of Beatles music in it. Um, although not performed by the Beatles. Um, but it was it was definitely it's worth a watch. I mean, I don't know if I tell you run out to the theater and see it, but when it comes on Netflix or, or whatever, it, it's probably something you guys should check out. Huh. Interesting. That's not mm-hmm. what I would have seen. Imagine you going to the theaters for. Yep. Sat in the big comfy seats too, the recliners. Oh, speaking of, we're gonna be doing that. Oh, that might not fit into our. That one might be one of the non books that we we squeeze yeah. into the year. Like, yeah. Uh, uh, Rob Zombie's Three from Hell, whenever yeah. it comes out. Did you look at the release like schedule for that? No. All right, so I'm doing this from memory, so I'm going to get it a little wrong. Um, there will be three preview nights back to back. Preview night one, I think, comes with like a limited edition poster for like the first fifty people that show up. Preview night two will include like. I don't know, behind the scenes or like some interviews with Rob Zombie about the movie and about the movies, I'm guessing. And night number three will be a double feature with The Devil's Rejects. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. So you get that. Well, obviously, I think he's trying to get big fans to go to all three nights. I'm totally not fucking doing that. Uh, I'm down for going to, to the whatever pre-release nights, whatever they're called. <laughs> yeah. Um, we collectively will have to settle on one. I mean, I'm not opposed to as long as there's a break between the movies. I'm going and seeing the the double feature. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I care enough about like the behind the scenes interview stuff. So, yeah. 
you know, but, um, yeah, I think it's really cool. But like I said, I think it's just a smart way for him to say, Hey, there are fucking people will show up like Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday or whatever days there are, but it's in uh, mid September. Cool. Yeah. Yep. Sounds good. I'm definitely, uh, down for us doing a review. One of our very, very infrequent movie reviews, um, for that one. To, to be fair, the one for 31 we did on YouTube and it was like 12 minutes long. So I don't know if it's, it's true. I don't know if it's going to be like a full episode of book. Yeah. 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 So, but who knows? Maybe we'll throw up another video review or something. Yeah. Hey, before we go, I have to issue an apology. Oh, so to me, are you apologizing to me? It's funny that your mind went there. You know, I have to apologize to one of our listeners. Um, okay. Uh, long time listener. Um, Corky, uh, talk to me about, you know, uh, is around our 400th episode and he said he said and this is he's he's a much smarter more clever person than me because he said you know what you have to do for episode 451 and i was like what (laughs) it just totally didn't occur to me it took me way too long to figure out he was recommending that we do a review of ray bradbury's fahrenheit 451 for a 451 first episode and that's brilliant i thought it was a great idea at the time (laughs) I, I listen, I, and I'm with you. On, I'm, I'm with you on this. We we struggled because we had a bunch of shit drop at the same time. And yeah, yeah, the timing was off. Multiple conversations were had about how to best do this. Now, I will say that I feel like we're at least a week behind because Tremblay's book came out a week ago. Um, Wanderers came out like a week ago, so we're already a little bit past where our comfort level is with scheduling. Yes. Had we have put it off for an additional week. Um, you know, Taft's book came out today. Like we would like to be ahead of these. So we're essentially at least a week behind. Uh, at some point we're going to get caught up so that we're giving these to you like fresh on the day of, or the day after a, a book is released. But that's really what happened. Um, Rob did lobby and there were discussions. And ultimately we decided that um, we had to put off um, that book until we do episode 1,451. I like the I like where your mind's at. Um, no, so yeah. we didn't actually decide on that, but you know <laughs> that way that way we've got at least you know ten years before we have to worry about it. Yep. So apologies to Corky. Uh, it was a brilliant idea, and I wish that we could have pulled it off. the The fates conspired against uh, such a wonderful idea, and so we're on four hundred fifty two with this book, and uh, there's only one four fifty one. So sorry, dude. Hey, listen, on on episode 420, we didn't review, like, a pot-related book. Yeah, we're really dropping the ball on on thematic uh, reviews. Episode 69 involved, (laughs) well, I was going to say no, but I'll just go with probably little oral sex. (laughs) Because I don't know. What was episode 69? Is there a way we can find out that Um, information? (laughs) I'll tell you in just a second. Oh, my God. (laughs) If we're lucky, the book we read sucked. (laughs) <laughs> Sucked. Oh, you're it. slammed. Get I got it. it. Yeah. You got yeah. it. Yeah. Right, oh my right, god, right, you're so right. funny. Uh episode sixty nine. Oh. Well, it probably sucked. It was a live reading noir at the bar with uh Caleb Ross. Oh well fuck Caleb J. Ross. So that was yeah. close enough. Yeah. Yeah, there so there's some coitus involved. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. mouth fucking Caleb <laughs> J. Ross. Jesus Christ, this is terrible. We should have oh we should have ended this podcast like nine minutes ago. <laughs> um thanks everybody for tuning in. Um go out and get Paul's new book. Come back next week and hear if you should get John F. D. Taft's new book. Until then, I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. Keep reading. <laughs>